Anais Dion is a scientist by trade and global citizen for life. Her worldly upbringing has given her a perspective like none other. By consistently moving, learning, and growing up in vastly different cultural environments, she knows firsthand the joys, triumphs, challenges, and struggles in communication and building relationships. I am going to discuss her journey today. Thank you very much, Anais, for talking with me today about your journey and where you expect to be over the next year. So let's get started. Okay. Um, you said you considered yourself a global citizen and difficult to tie yourself to one place. Um, where are all the places that you grew up? So I'm not going to count the places before three years old um, because I don't have any memory of that. In that list was... Cuba, Trinidad and Tobago, Germany. But the, since I was three years old, I lived in the States for six years. Then I lived in France for 10 years. And then I lived in England for three years. And then I lived in the States for four years. And now I'm living in Mexico. That's, uh, that's a lot of places. <laughs> What were the circumstances for moving so much? So my dad's an engineer uh, for an oil company. And so his job took him to places. Um, but less so since he started having children. And I'm the first one in the family. So. Mm. And um, your father is from France? Or from yes. Mexico? My, da my dad's French and my mom's Mexican. So I was okay. born in, in Mexico but have never lived there. So people can right. see it as like, oh, I'm finally coming back. But for, me, for me, it's more like I'm trying out a new country. And how, how would you say you've overcome the culture shock of moving from place to place throughout the years? I don't think I've actually overcome it. And I discovered that when I was living in Mexico. Um, when I moved from the U.S. to France when I was about nine years old, that was a really strong culture shock, and it felt like I was waking up from a dream. And I think that happened before France was kind of like a dream. Mm -hmm. And I think the reason I experienced it that way is because there were so many differences, and that's just the only way my brain knew how to assimilate change at the time. Mm -hmm. And then, And then I've started, like I... I've always been in international school, so meeting people from different places and of different personalities has never been an issue. And then when I graduated from high school, I was the one who chose where where I wanted to go. But I was surprised to fig like to realize that uh, living in Mexico was a culture shock, and I have absolutely nothing in common with the people here and with the traditions. Mm. Everything is completely foreign to me. And when I think about it, this is the first time I'm living in a third, well, either third world country or in development country. So mm -hmm. that may have something to do with it. I'm not completely certain about it because it's the first time um, I've lived in a country that hasn't been a first world country. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just interesting to see, you know, if I ever live in a different country, what it would be like. And that was a real surprise to me because I thought I'd overcome the entire part about cultural differences. That's really interesting because, like you said, you've done all this traveling. You think you were past that. You know, you were, you were past being shocked that this would be exactly. natural to, like, just know you're, you're, you're in a way a foreigner. You could just blend in or, or assimilate to some things, but, you know, still know, like, that you're you're not you're not from the area or not from there even though like you said your mother was from there yeah and I've traveled to Mexico my entire life there hasn't been a year when I haven't gone to Mexico um so so it was surprising to discover that there was a difference between visiting a country and living in a country exactly um what would you say has been the biggest challenge in communication and it doesn't have to be verbal communication. It could be just any type of, you know. 
Well, in terms of communication, what's really, really rough is the part about joking, right? Right. So even though I have both nationalities, people say that I'm French when I'm not in France. But then when right. I'm in France, people don't think I'm actually French. They think I'm from somewhere else, but they can't really pinpoint from where. Right. And so, and so what's really, really hard is actually like getting local jokes and then making jokes that people will laugh about. Um, oh. Sad story, but it's true. Mm. And like the entire situation just makes me laugh. So. Oh, yeah. And I, I, you're not the first person that I've heard that about um, like children who are, are born say, in the U.S. Or, or Canada and then their parents are from a, a different country. They say that like they say the same thing. They don't feel quite, you know, they don't feel quite American while they're here. But then when they're abroad, they're American. You know, you're, you're a Canadian or, you just, you know, like you said, it's the vice versa. So I have heard yeah. that before. Um, and just briefly, what, what brought you to Mexico uh, now? So I moved to Mexico in May 2017. So it's a... It's going to be about two years uh, that I've lived here. And there were, there were several reasons that were bringing me uh, to Mexico. I think the one that counted for about 50% of my choice, which is the biggest proportion, was the fact that I had a boyfriend here. And that was really important to me uh, after being in a long-distance relationship for quite a while. Um, so if that's 50%, the other 50% was split by the fact that I'm Mexican and I've never lived in Mexico, uh, by the fact that I had received a scholarship from the Mexican government to study my master's and I had to reinvest my knowledge in the country. Mm. And for the fact that back then I was studying in the U.S. and somehow going back to Europe or staying in the U.S. seems very um, unreachable at the time. And everything kind of just felt, everything kind of just led me to, you know, I should go to Mexico. And, and so I did. And this is where I am right now. And how is it to be, uh, how is it to connect with new individuals in Mexico or Monterey? So... It's been very, very hard for several reasons. Um, the first one is because I've never lived or studied or worked in Mexico. My network was comprised of my ex-boyfriend's friends and mm -hmm. some of my parents' friends. And it was really important to me that I managed to find work by myself mm -hmm. like as an independent a young woman and not because I was the daughter of someone or somebody knew right. me. So that's, right. that's how I would be able to get the job. And so I did. And since I found a job, uh, I, I only know people from, from work pretty much. Um, and it's been really hard to get to know people that aren't from work because uh, the people here in Mexico, even though, you know, that, they're warm people uh when you when you're in their country they're very very narrow-minded and closed so for example i know a lot of people at work and i get along very well with them and i would consider you know maybe one or two of my friends but they would never invite me to an event with their friends so that i can meet people that aren't from work so that has been one of the great cha greatest challenges mm. The other one is, even though, you know, I participate in some extracurricular activities, um, I don't know, it's, there's like this distance between me and them, and mostly because I already know there's a cultural difference. Uh, but I try really hard to, uh, to still approach people and keep an open mind that people aren't the same in a single place, and I want to be surprised by the people that I can get to know. So, for example, mm -hmm. the weekend, uh, I went to an event that was organized by a French association. And it's the first time, uh, like, I'm in contact with the French association. The first time I go to an event um, in the last two, almost two years that I've been here in Mexico. 
And I asked the organizer to introduce me to a couple of people. And I met a couple. And I hope that, you know, we can continue staying in touch. But people are also very uncommitted. So, so trying to think about how to put this. So they'll always say yes to you, but it's a yes that doesn't really mean anything. So right. whenever you go out with someone or you meet someone, they'll be like, oh, yeah, yeah, we should do something. But then never get back to you about anything. And so it's very disappointed because you're trying to connect with people. And people are just kind of like saying yes because they want you to think that they're nice. But the yes doesn't really mean anything. Right. It's, uh, it's very flaky. Yeah, it's a it's a social compromise. Yes, it's not a meaningful yes, and that's been mm. also a very important barrier for me because if I say yes, it means yes, and if I say no, it means no. Right. Which and is I, which is the that, word that should mean yeah. in the first place. Exactly. Um, I feel like that's a problem in like a lot of societies, which isn't isn't acceptable but you know that's i mean it's it, it, that must be really difficult um because you like i said on top of the fact that you know you don't you're you're trying to meet new individuals and trying to connect and mm. you know trying to make you know just keep yourself busy and you know have somebody that you feel like you can call you can count on and, and that's, that's disappointing um yeah. have I you tried Go ahead. So you were going to suggest? Okay? Yeah, yeah, I'm okay. Okay, okay. So um, I was going to say, have you ever tried using social media or dating apps to connect? Um, no, I've never used dating apps. Um, I don't really believe in the potential of, like, I, I don't really believe in dating apps to make friends. Um. Mm -hmm. I, th I think that's a that's a bad approach mm -hmm. and I've never been on a dating site but I've never really needed to go on a dating site because mm -hmm. I will go out with people but individually it'll never be like oh let me invite you to like this event right mm -hmm. um, where we can meet more people right right and then social media no actually something that I did was um, stay clear of social media because it was causing a lot of frustration in my life mm -hmm. and and just like I did something stupid um, I read someplace what if you put all your social media apps instead of on the main page of your phone on a second or on a third page so that you'd have mm -hmm. to swipe and then click to go on it and that has mm -hmm. been really helpful cool to um like let go of social media because it's really absorbing and it doesn't really bring you anything as an individual except the fact that you know you can keep up with your friends uh, but for me going through a difficult time it was just better to like stay focused on myself and not get distracted by things that were meaningless right okay hey listen i mean that that's i think those are that's if that's what worked for you um that's why i asked because some people feel like you know, they claim that, you know, social media or, you know, like they say, they use dating apps to meet people. I mean, I personally have never tried that, but, you know. Yeah. It's and it's funny, right? Because I'm considered a millennial, right? Because I grew up with technology, but I would never consider using technology to meet someone. That, that's right. just kind of weird for me. I, like in that sense, I'm still um, a bit traditional and I guess you could call it old fashioned if if that's yeah. the way you see it. Old, old school. Yeah. Yeah. For example, I talk on the phone with someone than text because texting just takes too much time. And you can say so much more um, talking without spending as much time on the phone. Exactly. Um, do, you, do you ever get lonely? No. Nope. Um, and what was I going to say? I'm kind of like bouncing around with some of these questions. Um, do you travel for work? No, 
Not right now. Supposedly, there were going to be opportunities. Um, none of the opportunities have come my way. I was really, really, really close once. And then the night before my flight, uh, my flight was going to be at 7 a.m. And the night before, around 10 p.m., I got a phone call from uh, the director. And uh, I was going to be traveling with him and his team. And he was like, Anais, I'm sorry, the the whole trip is is canceled. And uh, that was as close as I got to uh, a business trip. Oh, that's disappointing. Actually, I wasn't disappointed that time um, because I kept my mind open so that I wouldn't get disappointed in case mm -hmm. something happened and something did happen. So I get I was less annoyed but by the opportunity that I had to be able to go and not get it than the frustration I have that you know, I could be sent somewhere, but nobody ever sends me. Mm. Um, tell me about your, your current work. Like, what do you do and what got you interested in doing what you do? Okay. So just like uh, for context, um, I studied ecology and conservation biology. And then I got a master's in natural resources development, so all within the environmental sciences field. Mm -hmm. I got to Mexico. I tried to look for jobs in that field, but it was really, really, really complicated. And uh, considering the education and the bringing that I had, I was always going to be paid lesser than my value. And I right. knew that fact. Um, also, uh, environmental jobs are underpaid compared to the wages in Mexico. They're mm -hmm. very good jobs. And the fact that I wasn't connected to anyone or any organizations or any schools made it much more difficult as much as I tried, you know, getting to know people in the field. So on a Friday, I decided to apply to this job called Data Science Analyst. And I got okay. an interview and everything went really well. And so I got a job at a company called Semex as a data science analyst. Um, I, I, got, I guess uh, I managed to sell myself really well and uh, sell how my skills would contribute to the area and what they wanted to do. And as a scientist, you do, you do work with data, so it wasn't very far off from what they were looking for. Okay. And I have been in that position since I started, but right now I'm in transition uh, in the same company, uh, but now with um, the Global Customer Experience Office as a cultural analyst. So it's like 160 degrees change of venue. Uh, before I was working in a process in IT um, on data, and now I'm going to be working on designing solutions to improve the experience with customers. So business okay. and focused. Interesting. Are you, are you happy about the change? Yeah, it's very exciting. That's great. Yeah. Um, uh, do you feel that your experiences with all the traveling you've done and the culture shock and the different barriers you've, you've encountered has led you to this particular role? Um, it's a combination of yes and no. Um, the primary reason is that as I was a data analyst, um, I realized that, you know, everybody had these amazing skills at you know, programming and computer science and stuff. And where I, where they lacked in statistics, um, I I had the statistical skills, and where I lacked mm -hmm. in programming, they had the programming skills. But then nobody mm -hmm. ever focused on the communication of sciences, which I've always found really important. Because if you can't sell science, then it's worth nothing. Right. So after insisting for so much and getting a lot of rejection, um, I realized that I was wasting my time, and. In the project I'm currently working, I'm doing very little programming and a lot of contact with uh, different parts of the organization 
So communicating with people. And as much as it's really difficult to convince people to do what you want them to do, it's very exciting uh, just working with them. So I got so I got into the job expecting that I would improve my technical skills. But I've always said that if I'm going to learn one thing in Mexico, it's how to relate to people better. And mm-hmm. and it turns out that from like from the first month, I've been more business and communication oriented than I've been in the technical side. And so it was a very natural change uh, or decision for me changing to the customer experience. Also, I know nothing about business and I know nothing about customers, but those transferable skills, though, they're really useful. And um, and I hope that the company will be able to um, use my strengths uh, than what they've done in the past, which is not like kind of Try to mix me in a pool so that everyone's the same without taking interest in strengths. So. Right, right. And hopefully that's, with this position, I'll be able to travel. That's important. Do you, do you, do you see a future with this company? Granted, Sorry? you know, you see. Do you see a future with this company? Like no, I with don't. This company? Okay. No, not right now, but I can't promise that, you know, in a year from now or in two years from now or in five years from now, I'll feel the same. Uh, right now, I'd really like to go back to environmental sciences. Um, mm-hmm. I actually want to study a PhD, but sometimes I doubt whether studying the PhD is me trying to escape from reality or if it's definitely something I want to pursue. So in, on any account, I have a, an accountability buddy with whom every two weeks we get together and we share our progress on our applications for a PhD. Now, is he he's a uh, fellow, is he like from your company? Is he, you know, Mexican? No. no, this person is one of my best friends from my master's degrees. She's American and she um, is currently wa- working in Washington state um, as a, environmental like as an environmental consultant for the government and so she's oh, okay. working in ecology and environmental sciences so i think for her the whole phd search comes more naturally than it does for me because i'm constantly distracted by my work which has nothing to do with environmental sciences so you 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 stay in touch with her remotely yes long distance and yeah yeah and do you feel that it that's helpful to sustain like in general do you feel that staying in touch with people remotely has been successful for you in terms of being able to keep these contacts I mean other than your you know your family and stuff like that so I I would say yes that staying in in contact with people remotely has been successful but not because I talk to them all the time because the kind of people I know are the people that even if I don't talk to them for a year, will, you know, talk again. And then it'll be as if time passed by, but nothing had changed between us. So right. time and distance doesn't really do things when you share real friendships with people. And so for me, getting in touch with this friend um, every two weeks is a good way, not necessarily to stay in touch with her for friendship purposes, but more so that we can both help each other achieve a goal. And you also get the benefits of talking with a really good friend. So. Right, that that's awesome. That's that's really good to hear. And I feel like I I agree because, um, you know I I've, you know managed to for for ten years stay in touch with individuals I did study abroad with, and, um, I agree that you know there's you know a month can pass and you know and not for anything other than busyness and you know life getting in the way. But like mm-hmm. you said, you you know you once you start talking, it's it's as if like you said, nothing's changed. You know, you, you could talk about things, and it's like talking like when as if you were sitting across each other having a cup of coffee. So exactly. I, I do agree with that. And then also because of the travels that I've had throughout my life, and because of all the people I know in different parts of the world, um, it's hard to keep in touch with different time zones. But also my way of being is very compartmental. 
So wherever I am, I'll focus on the people that are where I am. And it'll be really hard for me to reach out for, uh, for a friend who isn't in the current location where I am. And I feel like that makes a lot of sense um, because, you know, it is, and it's not to be in any way a bad thing, but it's sort of an out of sight, out of mind. So it's it's not that you don't forget, you don't forget your friends, of course, but, you know, you like I said, you're going through the daily of life and, you, you know, you're not making that, you, you know, it's. It, it, there's definitely an effort that needs to be made and it's not for any fault that you're not making an effort. It's just trying to, like you say, compartmentalize, you know, saying, okay, you know, oh, I, I need to, Hey, I need to make it a, a point of shooting a quick text to this person, or let me give them a quick call or, you know, just, just to, let me send them a funny meme. Just so, you know, you're, you're you know, you kind of throwing the fish line out there. Like, Hey, I didn't forget about you. You know, and I also think it's really important to be able to fully live wherever you are. So if, you know, if you move somewhere new and you get stuck talking to the people from the past, then you're never um, having opportunities. You're never giving yourself opportunities to meet new people. And that's right. and that's a shame. So keep your friends from the past, definitely. But live, live in the present. So that right, the, right. you can have even more people to get in touch. That's really important to remember. Yeah. Um, and where, where do you see, you know, you know, you you had told me that you're doing some traveling this year. Um, uh -huh. And what, what other things are you looking forward to in 2019? We'll definitely have a better year than in 2018. So far, it started really well. Um, I don't know. Um, that's a really tough question for me because I've always thought of myself of someone who chooses paths rather than uh, has objectives that they want to achieve. Um, and so for me, uh, yeah. Thinking about goals is very, very complicated because my mind doesn't work that way. Then mm -hmm. somebody, somebody once told me not long ago that if you can't have objectives for your life, you're basically wandering um, endlessly in some sort of limbo where you're not accomplishing things that you desire. So, mm -hmm. so the first question for me is, what is it that I really want so that I can set myself mm -hmm. up? And so... Last year, we had a, an exercise at work. We get all this soft skills training. Mm -hmm. and, and I still conserve um, what I made out of it. And so it says, by 2027, I think, um, I have a PhD and I have my dog and I've traveled to, I think, five new places or something like that. Mm. So... so the idea behind this was that if you have an idea and you write it in paper and set a date for it, that's when it becomes a goal and then you work towards achieving it. So okay. for, for me, it's just a matter of like having a clear idea, like what it is that I want and think about the long term. So for example, whenever I make decisions at work, whether or not to join a team, or, or to take in a position, I think about it like what's my what's my immediate benefit? Like what am I getting from it now? And then what am I going to gain from it in three years? And is this a smart choice or is this a selfish choice? And then that's what allows me to make decisions and stick by them. But I I've been really bad at planning for the future. No, oh, it. I think that's that's normal. I mean, I think you're at least you, you, the way you just outlined it though is is very smart. And I wish, I wish sometimes I hadn't thought of those things through before I made certain decisions. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, you know, I guess what I'm getting at is like, for example, like, do you see yourself? 
you know, you see yourself in the same position for the next year and you're on this, this team or you're working towards this project for, for a customer and, and, and doing this communication at work. Do you um, do you also do you see yourself still staying in, in Mexico over the next few years, or do you see yourself traveling or moving out to somewhere else? Do you see yourself taking uh, doing a PhD program elsewhere? So uh, there's a two part answer to your question. Uh, okay. The first part is when I decided to move to Mexico, I knew it was going to be temporary. And it was going to be a one or two year thing. And I'm about to reach the two year mark in the timeline, but I haven't yet reached the two year mark at work. Mm. So that's the first answer, the first part answer to the question. Second part answer is if I study a PhD, when I study a PhD, it definitely won't be in Mexico because. The country has very little options to offer me as a as a scientist in ecology and out and also as a woman, it's very limited. And I won't find a program that I like or with the academic prestige that I'm looking for here in Mexico. Mm-hmm. Okay. I would, for example, consider studying, you know, in whatever other country in the world and having my research based in Mexico. That would be completely okay. different because it would be the topic of my research, which would be in Mexico and not the institution that I'm working with or the professor that I'm working with. Mm-hmm. Um, so both answers lead to the same conclusion, which is I don't see myself living much longer in Mexico because my my lifestyle has always been very nomadic and I'm not ready to settle down yet. Do you, when, do you have a place where you would like to settle down? Uh, not yet. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, um, you know, I think you've, you've got a lot to, uh, that you're working through and I think you will be successful. Um, you know, being able to connect, you do have, you know, you have kept the note, you obviously have an open mind and you've kept an open mind. Um, and you know, at least the next few steps, even if they're very vague um, regarding your, your career and possible getting your PhD. So I think, you know, it, I just find it very interesting that you've been able to work through a lot of the cultural shock and, and, you know, you, you know, you're human too, you know, you're, you're have to be able to take the, the punches and the falls where they may. And, uh, I, I just think I think your story is really interesting. So I really appreciate that you were able to talk to me today. Um, sure. Like I said, if there's anything else you want to say, I will end the interview. Um, no, I think I think you've asked like very very smart questions, and even if you ask them to ten other people, their answers will be completely different from mine. So I think this is I think you've really thought about it, and it's going to help you for your research, and. As I told you before, don't wait for someone to go traveling with. You can always come visit me in Mexico. Done. I'm on the plane right now. <laughs>